Sure. Yep. We're live. All right. Welcome, everyone. This is State Representative Jeff Shipley. I'm joined today by, um, I guess, legendary mycologist Paul Stamets and also amateur mycologist Jesse Knox of Southeast Iowa. Um, great to be with you, gentlemen, this morning. Thanks so much for making the time. A lot of I mean, I, I think if you're watching this video right now, you're already on the cutting edge of health, on the cutting edge of po public policy. Uh, what we're really excited about is House File 459 to decriminalize psilocybin. And uh, because we have some really great uh, experts with us today, I guess, Paul, I'd love to get started by just asking you, when we're talking about mushrooms, fungus, mycelium, substrates, all these things, uh, what the heck are we talking about and why are we talking about them? Well, um, so the, there's, you know, we've had a long interaction with mushrooms in the natural world for literally thousands of years. Uh, what has really come to the forefront just recently um, is not only are, is this a largely untapped um, biological or mycological library of knowledge, but most recently, um, given the challenges uh, for coming up with therapeutic treatments for depression, PTSD, addiction, um, you know, the current uh, psychotherapeutic uh, medicines have been woefully inadequate. Um, this is something that they can mollify um, some of the symptoms, but oftentimes getting to the root cause uh, that is causing so much distress in patients' lives is something that uh, has not been largely very successful. Um, so what has happened thanks to the pioneering work of many people, I would say it goes back literally thousands of years, but really Dr. Roland Griffiths from Johns Hopkins um, published a seminal article um, in uh, 1999 on the benefits of psilocybin uh, under therapeutic uh, conditions uh, for treating an, uh, people with uh, depression, uh, and this has evolved into uh, numerous other studies. So um, what I'd like to do just for the, for the sake of being able to convince the skeptics, and it's important that people are skeptical, it's important that people are critical, it's important that we are very careful uh, with the, the uh, bringing in new medicines um, to, the, uh, to the public. Uh, this is important that it's guided uh, by some of the best minds um, and it needs to have a, uh, we have an upside down relationship with psilocybin. Psilocybin is a schedule one drug that was put on the schedule one uh, by Nixon, Richard Nixon, President Richard Nixon in 1970 or so. Um, and schedule one drugs are highly addictive and they have no medical uh, use or benefit. Well, psilocybin is not highly addictive. <laughs> Anyone who's consumed souls eye mushrooms can tell you that it's something you do once or twice a year at most. Some people only do it once in their lifetime. That's all they do it. So it's not addictive by definition. In fact, it's been described as an anti-addictive drug. <clears throat> it stands out as being extraordinarily non-addictive. Non um, and then uh, it does have medical benefit. Okay, so, all right. So people will say, well, what, uh, what do you mean it has medical benefit? Who, who has authenticated this? So let me go ahead and I want to share my screen now. And um, I am, hopefully you can, I don't know if you can see that or not. Yep. yep. Okay. Um, <clears throat> these are the universities and institutions currently engaged in clinical studies on psilocybin and psychedelics. So they've gone through peer review They've gone through the institutional review boards. These are basically boards that are populated by medical professionals. They make sure that the application for a clinical study is using a compound, in this case, psilocybin, <clears throat> that <clears throat> has a good safety protocol that meets an emergent need not currently addressed by conventional medicine. Um, and it can be scaled. And that is, it can be made available. You don't want to invent a medicine that's so incredibly expensive that is outside the reach of being able to be therapeutically delivered. <clears throat> so um, Harvard, Johns Hopkins, Imperial College, Purdue, Stanford, Penn State, University of California, San Diego, University of Toronto. So 
an extraordinary number of universities um, are engaged or have recently completed clinical studies on psilocybin. So this, this, is, uh, this is a course of, of physicians, literally now in the hundreds. It used to be just a, uh, a handful. And now the number of physicians that are on board for studying this because of the dramatic improvements that are being seen with patients is extraordinary. Well, in North America, uh, we're, I'm going to add a few more universities. I couldn't get them all on one slide. There are so many. I think we're up to 40, uh, 47 registered trials. If you go to uh, clinicaltrials.gov, um, as of June, there were 47 registered psilocybin uh, trials. Um, and then also in Europe, this is occurring. Um, so uh, King's College, uh, the University of Helsinki, et cetera, et cetera. So this is why these, uh, this, these universities have looked at the science and they've realized that this is a paradigm shifting breakthrough medicine. In fact, the FDA has actually uh, given psilocybin a breakthrough medicine status. So the, and now I'm gonna, because of the sake of time, I'm going to go very. I'm going to skip forward uh, to to some of the studies that I think are really important for people to see. So I apologize this uh, for this uh, brevity, um, but this is important: is that there is a, a direct association with classic psychedelic use and a reduction in criminal behavior. Um, for instance, a the, a survey from uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services on inmates found that psilocybin use, if there's a, in the history of the, of the inmate, if there is a one-time use of psilocybin is associated with 27% decreased odds of past year larceny and theft, 22% decreased odds of property crime, 18% decreased odds for a violent crime. Now, the critics, and again, I, I applaud critics. This is important that we have critical thinking. Association is not necessarily causation. That is possible uh, that it's not. It's also equally possible or more so, I think, that it is. And I say that because we also know there's a direct correlation with one-time psilocybin use uh, with a reduction to partner-partner violence. This is 1,266 community members showing there's a negative relation between psychedelic use and intimate partner violence, especially between, uh, between men, men uh, to other men or other women, depending on your, who your partner is. Interestingly, it did not extend to women. And this is a real curiosity to many of us. Mm -hmm. So it reduces partner, partner violence. Well, think of the ramifications of the fact that it reduces larceny, criminal behavior, violent behavior, and there's also an increased nature of relatedness effect and a decreased uh, uh, attraction uh, to authoritarian, authoritarian political uh, views. So um, this is also reinforced that there's a pro, another study showing a prior pro-environmental effect. So this is the take home. Psilocybin mushroom use reduces criminality helps breaking addiction. And many of those studies that I mentioned are looking at opioid addiction. One study uh, with uh, tobacco uh, addicts showed a greater, I think, than 60% um, uh, of the tobacco addicts one year later after a single or two uh, sessions with psilocybin combined with therapy were no longer addicted to cigarettes. I mean, that's, that should, should resonate with so many people. Um, overcoming fear, PTSD, and we know now we have very good evidence that it increases neurogenesis. There is a Alzheimer's study going, going, ongoing right now with Johns Hopkins. We're planning some Alzheimer's studies on microdosing. So I think this is important, and I'm going to go ahead and now pull back and so and stop sharing my screen so we can talk about this. But for the sake of brevity, I just want everyone out there know this is based on the best of science. This is on the best of social outcome. Now, all of us know people or have friends, in my, face, my case, it's very personal within my family, um, who is an opioid addict. Mm. Um, and 
it's just because of his situation and the court system got a hold of him. You know, in some ways you're you're guilty until proven innocent, especially if you fit that stereotype. Um, but the implications and the harm it causes to our family, to my to my relatives, really to your neighbors, to your neighbors, to, to your neighborhood, to your to your city, to, to your state, to your country, to the world. So the ramifications that go outwards from these addicts or people being busted, for instance, for possessing psilocybin mushrooms. Hmm. You, you are criminalizing something that is actually the adverse of criminality. You're, you're criminalizing a cure against crime. Um, you're defeating the very solution that could be brought to the forefront to help the courts, help law enforcement, uh, help your community. And think about the, not only the social stress, but the financial stress. The court systems, once they get you into the court system, the number of hearings, uh, the lawyers that are involved, uh, the constant delays, uh, and having people being put in jail to have to support them. You know, and these, these, some of these individuals, rightfully so, uh, are now very upset. Very, they feel unjustly persecuted for something that was a victimless crime. Uh, so I think this is something that is uh, very important for us to reduce crime in, in our communities, to help the court system, help law enforcement focus on violent crime, uh, be able to help uh, these addicts resolve uh, their personal issues. What I've come to learn about addicts, which has been real new news to me, is that their pain is real. They are using opioids, not because they're bad people, because they have some sort of shame. They're, they are ashamed of who they are. They've made mistakes in their life and they're trying to self-medicate their pain. And they can't, and this is the only thing they, they, that helps them, you know, be able to, to have a temporary feeling state of being healed is by suppressing um, so much of the anguish and the distress that they have. So what I'm getting to is that the decriminalization of, of psilocybin uh, and indeed um, of psychedelics in general, I have one exception to this that I'd like to bring up. Um, I think it's very, uh, very meritable uh, for public benefit. And I would wish all of you would sincerely look at this as a, a very important social issue uh, that will help the commons. It'll help reduce crime. It'll help reduce recidivism. Uh, it gives a new therapeutic tools uh, to the psychiatrists and therapists that need to put this medicine into practice. Now, all the obvious caveats. You don't want to be on psilocybin mushrooms, driving a car, flying an airplane, operating a nuclear power plant. <laughs> Need I go on? I mean, literally, you're on the ground in your living room or on a couch. You're not going anywhere. Um, so these are powerful. That would be dependent on dosage, I suppose. I want to challenge you on that because you are talking about analyzing micro dosages. And, um, and I guess this is actually thank from you, a policy. Oh, thank you very much. And that's a really important uh, distinction. When we're talking about microdosing, we're talking about subsensorium below the feeling of uh, the uh, feeling any effects by definition. So uh, when you're doing these heroic, uh, uh, you know, amounts, then it's in a therapeutically it should be in a therapeutically supported environment. Uh, but microdosing, by definition, you feel no effect whatsoever, and that's what a lot of our research right now and microdosing and other people's research is showing tre tremendous. Um, as, as therapeutic benefits. Um, this, is, um, this takes it out of the doctor's office and empowers people at home. Uh, so we have a, a massive uh, study. It's available at microdose.me. Uh, we created a microdosing app. We have over 12,000 participants. More than half of them are non-microdosers. We just submitted a paper on microdosing uh, to a peer-reviewed medical journal. And we have another a paper that is in preparation as well. Um, and these microdosing is not causing any intoxication whatsoever. So thank you, Jeff, for bringing that up. It's really important. Um, 
And we also are planning more clinical studies or some clinical studies that are ongoing with microdosing. So microdosing did not involve intoxication. If you feel the effects, by definition, it's not a microdose. What weight do you associate with microdosing? Or is there a weight or I guess how, because I know there are people who are, and this is why I think, again, why it is an urgent policy solution, because we have a lot of people experimenting on their own, uh, because they do see the healing potential, but they see all the barricades up from, you know, the established um, science and criminal justice system. So I know a lot of people are experimenting on their own with these healing tools. Um, are you able to offer any sort of guidance in terms of like when you are submitting this clinical research, what kind of weights uh, are associated with a micro dose? And um, I don't know if, if yeah, you no, have such that's a, a very good question. I mean, you're, you're very, you're, you're asking very specific and precise questions. I will give you my opinion. Uh, people are welcome to disagree with me. I think the decriminalization for be a, should be 100 dried grams of psilocybin mushrooms or less. Okay, that's that is a thousand wet grams. That's 2.2 pounds of psilocybin mushrooms. With 100 dried grams at microdosing, you have more than a, you have a year supply, so people can just grow up one crop or whatever crops they have. They have enough for uh, be able to microdose. This is, you know, and be able to, to benefit from that. Um, so uh, reducing it down to one gram or five grams, it, uh, you can't control these crops. This is the problem is that you would not do inoculations and you don't know how good your crop is going to be. So by, by putting it to a really small amount, you can easily exceed that inadvertently because your crop was exceptionally good. Uh, oftentimes it's not, it's exceptionally bad. So it's hard to even grow these things, um, you know, in order to hit that threshold. But a hundred gram uh, threshold, I think, is a realistic um, and rational amount of psilocybin mushrooms in dried form uh, that you should be able to, to possess. So I think we lost Jeff here. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what he's doing. But so, um, and I hope I don't steal the, to keep the conversation going, I hope I don't stay away from Jeff's question. So in uh, your ideal world, uh, Mr. Stamets, um, how would you like to see psilocybin facilitated? Like amongst just therapists, do you have an issue and the normal therapy isn't working and they distribute that psilocybin and they go through that trip with their patient? Or what, what kind of uh, grand vision would you have to see psilocybin in the future? Well, um, you know, I, I run a, a current business uh, that sells gourmet mushrooms and uh, mushroom supplements. You know, I, I don't need to mention the, the business, but we're CGMP compliant. Uh, this is a good manufacturing practices. Uh, the commercialization of psilocybin must be conforming to CGMP practices. The individual cultivation for individual use is a whole different matter. Mm -hmm. That's part of the decriminalization effort. If this is commercialized to be used therapeutically and distributed, then this, the states uh, you know, and the health department needs to make sure that the product is safe. Uh, I think that's really important. What people may not know is that these mushrooms get bacteria on them. Mm -hmm. uh, they get molds on them. Mm -hmm. If there's not enough uh, air exchange or the conditions are not correct, you can. Uh, it's like selling spoiled fish. Right. Right. You, you, uh, we've all had food poisoning, I presume, <laughs> and so we don't want to give food poisoning, uh, you know, to to people unless there are good controls. So it's incumbent upon the states to create policies. Uh, that the uh, manufacturing is good agricultural practices when it's in a natural form. In some states, when you make an extract, then you've now gone into what's required CGMP, good manufacturing practices, federally registered, uh, regulated by the FDA. Mm. But this, the state health departments are also in, in alliance with the FDA to make sure that these companies are practicing the best standards. So mm -hmm. whether it's good agricultural practices or good manufacturing practices, once you alter the mushroom uh, to, from, its alt, from its natural state, you have now created, you've done something additional than mm -hmm. that which should be found uh, just from a natural form. Mm -hmm. So uh, that would include extracts. Could you speak now? Um, I do want to mention Host Defense is the business and they're a very popular product locally in Fairfield, Iowa. Uh, a lot of times it's difficult to keep them on the shelf. Um, 
I was very curious on how, I guess, just if you could speak to how you've been able to scale your business model in terms of, um, I, I'm not really a business savvy person. I'm trying to phrase this the right way, but, you know, making sure that you can scale your business and make sure that you can, I, I guess I'll put it this way. A lot of people need a lot of healing. And um, I think Jesse can talk about people who, you know, uh, there is a, a, um, a lot of demand for lion's mane mushroom. And for example, um, how, how can you, I guess when we are talking about adhering to these manufacturing practices, are you able to speak to how you've been able to scale up your business and be able to maintain robust production to keep up with all the demand that's going to be coming in? Well, it's, it's skyrocketing. I have 135 employees. Um, you know, I own hundred percent of my business. I have no partners. Um, I have no debt. I mean, to me, it's a, to many, it's a business miracle, but I packed 30,000 boxes before I had a single employee. Uh, it's been a long haul and I've only survived because of the kindness and generosity of people who've come into my life and who've supported me. So uh, we are, in terms of our own business, we're massively scaling. Um, so, but when it comes to psilocybin and if for you to become CGMP, for instance, when we became CGMP, the cost was about a half a million dollars. Mm. It was every single step in the process is audited by disinterested employees who are not uh, connected to each other. It's a stop gaps, the quality control, DNA analysis every time the material is transferred. Um, it is incumbent upon the manufacturers to strictly abide uh, by the health code. So um, sadly, in many ways, gone are the days of somebody creating a small little nutraceutical company out of their garage. I mean, that is still possible, but you have to have, you know, literally about a million dollars behind you just to, to, to conform to the FDA requirements. Now, within the states, uh, it may be different, but as soon as my understanding, as soon as you cross state lines, you involve the federal government. Mm. Um, you know, many conservatives are very pro-state rights, keep the federal government off the backs of the people. So I think this is a, a state's rights issue. This is a freedom of consciousness issue. This is a basic uh, civil right. We've had the civil rights movement, you know, mm. for that have given the women the right to vote, uh, that have gone, uh, that have empowered uh, African-Americans and other ethnic communities, the, the LGBT community. Etc. Well, this is this this is another civil rights movement. We all should be have uh, the rights to our own consciousness, the rights to our own body. You know, this envelope of me, Paul Stamets, I own this. Mm -hmm. You know, if I do something bad to my neighbor or to another citizen, uh, then yes, I have now uh, gone beyond you know the envelope of Paul Stamets to have committed something that has societal impact. If I'm doing something internally, I don't want the federal government telling me what I can and cannot do. Is there any conservative that objects to that? I think not. I think, you know, this is, the, this is a bridge between conservatives and liberals. There's a basic fundamental civil right to keep the federal government uh, from interfering with our personal lives. Well, uh, that, Paul, that, being, that being said, I think we have a tremendous social responsibility to make sure that we do this right. I, I just love it. I love uh, diving into the political philosophy and, and I've even experienced it a step further where, I mean, mushrooms being, or excuse me, psilocybin in particular, being a source of unification and togetherness and unity. And even this, um, I had a conversation with Dennis McKenna earlier this week. He used the phrase, a right to symbiosis. I mean, we're talking about a right uh, to relationship with nature, communion with nature, communion with this, uh, millions of years or thousands of years of mycological library of knowledge that you men mentioned before. So this is like really, really deep stuff. And it does connect into identity, meaning, purpose, destiny, uh, our purpose on this planet, the universe, etc. cetera. So um, yeah, Jeff, let me interrupt you. I, I'm fully on board. Dennis is a great friend of mine. Everything you just said, you just lost 90% of the conservatives. Ah, okay, guys. I'm gonna tell you if you if the conservatives here, it's a basic civil right of keeping the federal government uh, out of my body and out of my house, then you just got 90% of the conservatives on board. Even though we this may ultimately be the launching pad for a tremendous a, a spiritual experience where the, we have the feeling of oneness with everyone on the planet, I think focusing on the civil right aspect of this 
will get us across the finish line because it is time for us to, to reach a hand across the divide. I have a breakthrough uh, discoveries with bees that are paradigm shifting. Um, I publish in Nature, my article in Nature with my colleagues in the top 1% of all articles ever published in Nature uh, for saving bees from colony collapse. Well, who doesn't want to save the bees? Farmers want to save the bees. Hippies want to save the bees. I actually proposed to Washington State, they tax marijuana 1% to help save the bees because the hippies and the stoners will want to save the bees. The farmers will go great. The conservatives will go great. We'll take the money from the liberals, right? So everybody wants to save the bees. In the same sense, I think we have to create a bridge of communications. And so I just, I think it's important if you're going to communicate uh, to others, and so many, so many people listening to this have personal members in their family that have been harmed or, or partially destroyed by from the opioid uh, uh, crisis. It is a serious, serious crisis, and so you know the drug war has not worked. Now, it, you know, it, it's, and I think that, so. It's important that I think we 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 have to hear the voices of conservatives. This is, this, is, this is really important. This is not a liberal agenda. This is an agenda for empowering families, protecting families, and protecting your own civil rights from interference from the federal government or the state government. Now, and again, I love it. There's music to my ears, and um, I do consider myself a conservative, and it's uh, proud to be a member of the Republican Party pushing this bill. Um, and again, I... I you're 100% correct, or well, overwhelmingly correct. And I certainly want to applaud how you did concisely make the case with your slides earlier in five minutes or less, hitting that perfect frame in terms of practicality and tangible benefit supported by the science. But I guess the reason why I did uh, aspire to that lofty rhetoric is because I feel we are at a moment in time where, I mean, the knowledge is there, it's at our fingertips, we see these global problems emerging. And it is kind of a use it or lose it moment. And the world is changing so fast. And we really need to get up to speed and pick up that um, I, I don't want to lose sight of these grander truths that are, frankly, as you mentioned, I mean, self-evident, at least when you get um, that experience past that certain threshold, you know. So um, anyway, it is so fun to explore the political science dynamic of this. And, um, and it's just such an important uh, conversation on, on every single level. Um, Anyway, uh, what do you got, Jesse? What do you think of all this? You're a pretty conservative guy yourself in rural Iowa. What do you, what's your take? Well, I totally agree. I mean, at first I was pretty hesitant about psilocybin, but after listening to you on Joe Rogan, Mr. Stan. Now it's psilocybin, like, right? We're saying psilocybin, psilocybin yeah. is the prop. Psilocybin. Yeah. Psilocybin. Pardon me. I was home learned. Okay. So <laughs> from rural Iowa, you expect. But anyway, no, um, I was pretty hesitant, but listening to your testimonies and your personal story with it and others, I was like, well, gosh, it seems like a lost connection of humanity. I mean, mushrooms have been part of humanity's story since probably, I don't know, maybe the stone ape theory. I don't know. But it just seems like we're like the opioid the, the, a, a, pandemic, excuse me, epidemic. Um, obviously, just, you know, whatever our solutions are to help people get off these harmful substances aren't working. And so why not take one trip? I mean, I, I've never had experience with it at all. I'm terrified of it, but I respect it. But if it can help heal people's souls, then what are we doing? What's the delay? I mean, is it just money keeping these things going or why not try the mushroom? It seems to be working for others well, for I, sure. Yeah, I, I, grew up, I grew up in a conservative, charismatic, a charismatic Christian environment. Um, I grew up in rural Ohio. Uh, my mother was a charismatic, charismatic Christian leader. It took a number of years uh, for many of her uh, fellow leaders, and actually one of Billy Graham's inner circles, uh, one of his members of his Council of Twelve, uh, came to visit me with a personal message from Billy Graham. Um, and a number of the people in his inner circle have came to Christianity, came to Christ through psilocybin mushrooms, <laughs> and they That's they considered. And a number of them would never do it again. Mm. This is the amazing thing to me. And, ba and Terrence McKenna had that great, great um, phrase. And when you when you when you get the message, hang up the phone, right? So, um, but you know, so it 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 is can be a life changing experience. Um, and by any stretch of the imagination, for many people, is spiritual. So depending upon your your spiritual upbringings, etc., I think it. 
it creates nicer people, kinder people, more spiritual people. Uh, the golden rule is pervasive in all major religions. Do unto others as they would do unto you. You would want them to do unto you. And I think this is, um, this is it's just so miscategorized to be calling it a schedule one drug, a, a, a drug of abuse. You know, I think we need to have the guardrails and I welcome um, a certain level of regulation for the commercialization. For personal use, please, let's get rid of the laws that turn good citizens into criminals. You know, this is not, this is not a best use of public funds, public policy. You're creating a uh, of by having, um, and so I think it's a great opportunity for Iowans. And I, I have to tell you my story about Iowa. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, I um, back in the 1970s, there was a whole nation on the road hitchhiking. I mean, it was during the anti-Vietnam uh, War movement, the pro-environmental movement, the civil rights movement. I mean, there was literally there was a, a, a sub-nation moving across the country. So I hitchhiked across country 13 times. Iowa always was different. For some reason, I mean, I had all these women pick me up in Iowa who invited me back to their farm to have dinner, to wow. meet their family. It's like, what is going on with the women in <laughs> Iowa? <laughs> like the nicest women in the world. I mean, I'm like right. a weird hippie and these conservative women, you know, are inviting me back to their homes. Um, you know, nothing, no, no weird. I mean, it's all just genuine. Where are you from? I'm interested in your story. And we have a great dinner, you know, come meet my family. But I'm going, to, I, all my life, I'm wondering, oh man, I just want to go back and hitchhike in Iowa to meet the Iowan women. You know, they're just like so generous and wholesome and way above the norm uh, from my experience and, and being not only trustworthy, but wise. Now that's, of course, that's a generality that's specific to my own experience, but I just want to give a shout out to all those Iowa women who picked up this lonely, long-haired hippie hitchhiker oh. and took me into their homes and met their husbands, their family, and um, never an adverse reaction. It was like, <laughs> wow, these people got it. And, you know, it's like, you know, true Christians walk their talk. Mm, right. You know? you know, they don't they don't vilify and demonize uh, those that are not of the same faith. They extend it in the hand of generosity and compassion. And that's the big lesson that I've learned in my life is um, courage, compassion, and kindness. Well, and then how that, leads, how that leads to very positive outcomes. So I would surmise that that kindness that they showed you 40 years ago is exactly why your testimony is now going to change the state of Iowa for the better uh, next week. So there really is a nice ebb and flow to just the energetic health and healing of the world. I want to kind of go back to something Jesse said, because Jesse was explaining like how he thought these mushrooms were great, but how he himself was afraid of them. And um, I wanted to kind of explore that a little bit of what the heck is Jesse afraid of? Is there something to be afraid of? Um, does that fear serve a purpose in terms of self-regulating the behavior? And then um, just because if this law was enacted and we had complete decriminalization, a lot of people have some trepidation. Um, I don't know. One of my favorite questions to always ask is, what is the most irresponsible thing that you've ever witnessed or knew about or heard about in terms of uh, mispractice or misuse of these, I think, what are pretty clearly sacred substance, uh, sacred substances or what even some people call sacraments. So I don't know if you want to explore that a little bit, but I'd be curious well, to hear your take. You, you've bundled a lot up in there, Jeff, and I'll try to sort of disambiguate this a little bit. Um, how do you explain to a blind person what sight is? Mm. How do you explain to a deaf person what sound is? Yeah. How do you explain to a person who's never swam in water what water is? Um, I used to hang glide. Um, how do you explain to a person what free flight is? Um, it's, it's outside of your normal uh, realm of experiences. So it's natural to fear that which is unknown. It's not that you haven't experienced before. That's a perfectly normal human instinct, you know, of staying within your comfort zone. When you know something is so powerful and it's not in part of your normal comfort zone of experiences, then it's natural to fear that. Given that, it's really important that you're with a skilled therapist 
Um, the the modality that therapists are have ad adopted now is a male and female, uh, experienced, sober, uh, uh, you know, companions to, to be there with you who have had these experiences. So you have the confidence and the people that are there with you have been on this path, they're your guide. And so you know, you have that, oh, okay, I'm relieved. I'm with people who are experiencing this. It's male and female. So there's no funny business that's gonna go on. And, and that's really, really important. So um, facing the fear of the unknown, well, that's, that's what we have done as humans. That's why we've made it to the moon. That's why we've gone to Mars. We are natural adventurers. But those are people who adventure are on the cutting edge, uh, oftentimes are paying the price of their failures and successes to train us who follow how to have best practices. So uh, the worst experiences, um, the worst experiences that I know that, and I, I don't like the word shroom, folks, so <laughs> don't use the word shroom around me. To me, it's a biological racism. These things are, are special medicines. They're really important. The, the, the worst experiences that I know of is someone taking them at parties and suddenly having a massively powerful experience and then everyone around them, they can't relate. Mm. They're on a different level. Mm -hmm. You know, they're on, a, they're on a level of partying and drinking and these people are having this profound experience and they just need, they need some help. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're not getting help from the people around them. Uh, and so they're like facing these issues all themselves. They feel isolated and alone. Uh, so I think it's really important that you have good companionship of experienced individuals. Um, and this is why thera therapeutic uh, models are so important. Uh, we need the best psychotherapists on board. Um, and I think that, you know, again, the, if, you, if, there's a, if there is allowed the commercialization of psilocybin, it has to be done in conjunction uh, with the medical universities in Iowa, uh, the medical hospitals, uh, the clinicians who need to be trained. And uh, MAPS and Johns Hopkins and these universities have set up these protocols. You don't have to reinvent them. They're already there. Uh, so I think uh, having uh, the benefit of people who've, done this thousands and thousands of times uh, is much better than having a one-off, which is what I mentioned this person uh, being in, having this profound experience of resolving childhood abuse, <clears throat> all sorts of sexual abuse issues, and then have nobody in the surrounding environment that understands, and then feeling that a sense of abandonment and loneliness, uh, that's, that's probably the worst experience that I know of because it'd been so nice if somebody said, put their arm around them, say, let's get out of here, let's go for a walk. Let's get away from this scene. Let's sit down underneath the stars. Tell me about your life. Tell me what hurts. And what they found in Johns Hopkins is 14 months later with patients who have PTSD experiences, re-remembering the psilocybin experience that led to resolution of PTSD became the resident memory of the PTSD. Mm. So it's the re-remembering of the experience that gave therapeutic benefit. Uh, how many therapeutic drugs do that? Mm -hmm. Where you actually mm -hmm. go, oh my gosh, I was laying in this field in Iowa in the cornfield. <laughs> <laughs> the farmer didn't know it, but I was in bliss seeing the universe and I'm in love with everybody. I'm in love with with Christians, with atheists, I'm in love with Islamic people. We're all on this planet together. Don't you see? Well, that's the big message that comes through is a unanimity of humanity and the human rights that we all share. And the ultimate human right is that you have a right to your own consciousness and your life. We're all gonna die. Who dare tells us at the end of our life, what is legal or illegal for us to change our consciousness. I mean, I, that to me is a criminal act. The criminal mm -hmm. act is trying to have the government control your consciousness. Mm -hmm. Well, this is what mm -hmm. dictators do. Right. This is what happens and the, the, we know all these authoritarian mm -hmm. regimes all over the world. It's the suppression of human rights and the controlling of consciousness. 
And so I think this is the ultimate Bill of Rights, is that we should have a Bill of Rights, a new Bill of Rights for the freedom of consciousness. Will mm -hmm. Iowa step up to the plate? I mean, I want the women of Iowa to hear me. <laughs> you can lead on this. <laughs> oh, man, you are just making my heart sing in so many ways. And uh, I, I just wish you've been so perfect. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, I think I have everything I need for my legislative project that any additional question would just be an exercise in self-pleasuring. Uh, but Jesse, I know I know um, Mr. Stamets is a hero of yours. So I want to give you the opportunity for the last question or last discussion point to to end this uh, well. So Jesse, anything else for Mr. Stamets? Yeah, I'll try to make this quick. I was thinking about this concept for a while now. I just want to bring it to you and see what you think. Um, so I, I do some indoor cultivation, but I also do some outdoor cultivation. I have some shiitake logs. And uh, my background, though, before I got into mycology was uh, land management, habitat management. So pretty much I did a lot of forestry work, native prairie establishment. And so I'm, I'm a big fan of wildlife and establishing more habitat for wildlife. And uh, I thought it was so cool when I was in my timber, I had some white oaks and I'm like, wait a minute, I can do my TSI, my timber stand improvement and utilize that for shiitake logs. It's like, this is awesome. So you pick the crotch you want to leave for a later harvest, but pick the, the lesser quality tree of shiitake logs. Like, it's just really cool. Well, I, I did a couple classes at our local extension office and I start talking about <laughs> picking the right tree and everything and everyone's eyes just glaze over. I think they want to hear about the income and how to do all the general stuff. But to me, it was so important to talk about the timber and this positive impact we can leave behind as we cultivate mushrooms, especially the outdoor level. And uh, the one project I'm working on on my farm where Jeff lives at, um, I'm working on a, a oak savanna restoration. Have you, are you familiar with that term at all, Mr. Stamets? Yep. Okay, fantastic. Yep. And um, I was really excited because I went through a walk on my property. There's just one ditch that's full of old oak savanna. And I'm so ashamed of myself. I came up in the back of this one white oak. You can see from our house. I've seen this tree for 13 years of my life. And the very back side was dried up maitake. I'm like, oh, all this time they've been here. I had no idea. But it was really exciting to me that, okay, so we can start restoring this savanna but also what comes with it in a grassy savanna situation, these oaks, maitake, and also the trees I'm going to cut that are not part of the oak savanna. Maybe you can grow reishi or just oysters or lion's mane, whatever. And so I guess to me, I'm trying to get across is, as you're talking about connecting bridges with conservatives and liberals, I think uh, my, and my podcast is more geared towards uh, other landowners, hunters, trying to encourage guys, let's improve our property, for, for all wildlife and put wildlife in mind. And I think this is really cool where mycology and the wildlife can come together and we can make this really cool, positive environmental impact instead of always a human negative in impact, like not raping our timber and not just being more conscientious with the trees we harvest. So, and also I, I thought it'd be, I just thought it was really cool. Like maybe we can encourage more people doing this oak savanna restoration like there's one going on the lemansky project in oregon south of you and it's like i just want to keep throwing more um reasons to why and maytake is such a strong health mushroom and all the, like i said the trees come off of it i just want to try to keep finding more reasons like let's spearhead this because of mushrooms because of wildlife because this is what natural history looked like just for the love of it so i was wondering what you thought about that concept well, I think the most important thing that people can do is uh, is replant trees, plant mm -hmm. more trees, mm -hmm. uh, and create uh, pollination, uh, diverse habitats for bees. Uh, the monoculturing, uh, where all the pollen comes in uh, one week or two weeks, and then the bees have nothing else. There are pollination, uh, pollen land, uh, 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 you know, deserts because there's not enough diversity. When we start planting trees, you in a shade environments, you create increasing biological complexity. Um, and decomposition should be celebrated. Every no-till farmer knows this. I have an interesting background. My family has uh, had 10,000 acres of wheat. Um, um, I'm very happy to be a, a wheat owner. I own 200 acres now of my family wheat farm. Wow, awesome. Um, and I also set chokers and work in the woods for three years. I pulled on the green chain. I, I cut down part of the old growth forest. You know, we were doing three log loads three logs on a logging truck. That's how big the trees were. Um, three of guys on my crew got killed. Oh, uh, sorry to hear uh, that. Yeah. Some of my best friends in my, in my life were people who were, didn't have a college education. You're in the brush with them. 
they're watching out for you and you're watching out for them as a reciprocal relationship. Right. You know, and I think this is what happens in, in with the military too. You know, you build these bonds because you know who you can depend upon. And some of the smartest people I ever met were in my, and I know it's a, this academics like, oh, they don't want to hear this, but some of the smartest people I've met have been my fellow loggers. Uh, they had word a worldwide wisdom that I want them in my lifeboat um, <clears throat> when, when a push comes to shove. So uh, what I learned from that is the, the idea of a, of a com complex environments that are created by varied, um, uh, by trees, species um, of not only variety, but of different ages. Mm -hmm. uh, nature loves highly fractalized surfaces. Right. So the more fractalization you have, of little tiny niches and bigger ones and bigger ones, mm -hmm. then you create all these little mm -hmm. ecosystems that then set up guilds of cooperation. Mm -hmm. And when you have these guilds, these communities, then they support each other. Mm -hmm. And so biodiversity is biosecurity. Absolutely. Mon monoculture, even though it's industrially effective, and mm -hmm. I, I'm an advocate also of, of being a wheat farmer, you know, there's the e economies of scale. Uh, but given the importance of maintaining biodiverse zones around commercial agriculture, it really cannot be emphasized enough. Mm -hmm. It's so important that people then and, and farmers know this just from leaving fields fallow, from using cover crops. You know, we I plant lots of clover because there's lots of it's a bee friendly uh, uh, plant, um, and so it's a it just speaks to this. You know, farmers have a wisdom of nature that really needs to be better respected. Mm -hmm. You know, the farmers need better scientific tools, just like machinery, better machines. You know, they need better, you know, scientific knowledge to be able, in a sense, to implement what they intuitively already know. And uh, this goes with indigenous people, with farmers who are in contact with the soil. I just read an article uh, yesterday the, you know what the average number of microbes there are in a one gram of healthy farm soil? 100 billion. Oh my gosh, wow. <laughs> That's intense. 100 <laughs> billion microbes in a gram of soil. That, I mean, the soil it truly is living. It's not sterilized, you know, just minerals and other nutrients. It is a living microbiome. Mm -hmm. And the more we invest in the biodiversity, um, and this goes across even the human species. The more we invest in biodiversity, the more biosecurity that we have. And this is the big picture that's certainly come to me from my upbringings. And, and I, I've been fortunate to be in a nexus of different bridges in the academic community, the school of hard knocks, as I call it. Um, and so I think there's a way of integrating uh, people together. And I think mushrooms uh, really are a great connector for that. Excellent. All right. Okay. Well, uh, on that note, just thank you so much for your time today. And I uh, hope we can do really uh, do a good job and make you proud next week. Okay. Anything I can do to help Iowans? Um, you know, I owe a debt of gratitude. <laughs> as, you can, as, <laughs> you, as you heard. <laughs> well, back at you. Uh, eternally grateful and um, looking forward to sharing more of that gratitude in the future. So looking forward to staying in touch and keeping you abreast of all the good work. Yeah, uh, let us know. We have some other ideas that might be able to help you as well, okay? Right. But folks, please abide by the law. You know, I want to be very clear. Let's do this legally. And let's have the legislature and Iowans uh, create uh, the legal envelope for societal benefit. We need your help. Thank you. Amen. All right, thank you. Take care. All right, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.